I sat with a vacant expression on my face, staring out the window. As Sheriff Farrar and Richard drove me back to the cabin, I watched the trees gently pass as the vehicle made its way carefully down the main trail. I looked into each crevice of darkness, each pocket of a black abyss, wondering how such a place of natural wonder could harbor such evil. I really thought that I had it all figured out, and like always, I got it utterly and completely wrong. Are you okay, James? I'm not a robot, and I know it's a lot to take in. Richard asked as he looked at me, over his left shoulder, peering through the gap between his seat and the car exterior. I simply nodded, if you could call it a nod. I wasn't really in much of a talking mood. I wouldn't know what to say, even if I was. We're gonna need a more definitive answer, son. We need to know that you understood everything we told you before we let you out of this car. The sheriff's warning was stern. For your own good, as much as anyone else's. It seemed Richard was playing a good cop. At least now, you can see that we aren't the bad guys. The sheriff said in a huff, clearly still offended. The vehicle pulled up outside the cabin. Both men leaned over their seats to look through me in the back. I gave them my attention. So, James, are we going to have a problem? Richard asked, wanting confirmation. I brought my chin up and their gaze fully, letting them know I was engaged fully. I understand. You won't have a problem. The two men turned to face each other, as if to gauge in a nonverbal manner whether they believed me. They nodded to one another in satisfaction. Okay. So, what are you going to do? Richard asked, wanting me to show him that I had listened. I'm going to never talk or think heavily about Edward Keller between the hours of 10.25 p.m. and 8 p.m., I stated. Good, Richard replied. I'm going to burn that stack of newspapers and anything else that bears Edward Keller's name. Yeah, and finally, Richard asked. I will memorize the five steps, I said. Richard cocked his head, as if I was missing something. I smiled. But only between 8 p.m. and 10.25 p.m. Well, Bob, I think he's got it. Richard said to the sheriff with a smug smile on his face. The sheriff didn't seem too convinced, though. Yeah, well, we'll see. I think this is a mistake, personally. We protected this town for too long, Rit. Bob, I said we're giving James a chance. This came from a place of wanting to protect the people of this town. I don't think he's going to let us down. I sat there, watching Richard literally talk the town sheriff down from wanting to kill me. It was a surreal moment, I won't lie. But I did mean what I said. I got out of the vehicle, thanking Richard and Bob for the ride. They gave me one last reminder that this was my one and only chance to quote, play ball. I once again did my best to convince them that I would. I entered the cabin, watching Bob Ferrar's police-issued Chevy carefully reverse back onto the trail as I closed the door behind me. I checked the time, 10.02 p.m. I didn't have much time. I grabbed the newspaper articles from the side of my bed and dragged them out to my cabin's back porch where I had a burn barrel. I tossed in every tabloid, doused in lighter fluid, and threw in a match. The flames felt lovely and warm against my chilled skin. I prepared myself a coffee, pulled up a seat next to the fire, and I reminisced about the revelation of what is really going on here at Wolf Lake. The entire glass of whiskey began to swish up each side of my stomach. The relaxing, calming effect of the alcohol beginning to reach my extremities, taking the edge of the intense atmosphere. There, the entire glass is gone. I said as I slammed the glass bottom down. Get him another, please, Phil. Richard didn't look too satisfied. What the hell? What is this, pre-drinks? Will someone just tell me what is going on? I said, growing impatient. 
James, just take another drink. Believe me, you'll need it. Phil interjected, placing a friendly hand on my back as he placed another glass of whiskey in front of me in an attempt to put me at ease. Can someone just tell me what is going on? I asked, using the calmest voice I had produced all evening. Richard looked satisfied with my demeanor. He looked at Sheriff Ferrar as if on cue, and he produced a file and handed it to Richard. He passed me the documents and invited me to read it by gently nodding his head forward. I opened up the binder. A picture of a man greeted me. A man matching the description of Edward Keller's mugshot was hanging from a tree. A rope was around his neck. The muscle tissue around the noose had torn and was bruised in a bad way. His eyes were open, wild, and the scariest thing was he was smiling. However, he was dead, very dead. There were other factors that made this whole event extremely questionable. First of all, he was naked. Not a single item of clothing was on his body. And second, there was a symbol painted on his torso. The ink looked to be a brown shade of red and was extremely thick. The tree was huge. A towering oak that looked a main stable point of the forest. The thick branch that bore the rope was at least 20 feet off the ground. The rope was fed through a fork in the branch with one end hanging to make the noose and the other end traveling down, and it was anchored to the base of another tree. I studied the pictures while the sheriff explained what I was looking at. That's Edward Keller. As you can see, he's dead as dead can be. You were right, though. We did cover something up. We painted it as he did it himself. We told the public that Keller hung himself to avoid trial. And prison, but as you can see, it wasn't that. It was a murder. I was stunned. My gaze began to switch from the photos of Sheriff Ferrar and back again. Looking for more input, he obliged. The way the rope had been tied, and the height of the branch, it could have only been done with help. What is the symbol on his torso? What does that mean? My question, along with my vision, was aimed at anyone who could answer me. The sheriff looked at Richard, as if deeming him more qualified to answer this line of questioning. Okay, I'll feel this one. That drawing on the chest that you're looking at, that is the symbol of the cult of Kettle Moraine. They are a clandestine satanic church who the FBI have been investigating since the mid-1970s but the group's history goes back all the way to pagan times. A little bit of background about the group. They worship an ancient woodland god known as the Cathodic Black Goat. A lot of research has gone into the group's beliefs and among other twisted views about the links between the woods and the roots of trees being a direct gateway to the other world. They also apparently claim to have summoned the Goatman and the Beast of Bray Wood but most people just write them off as religious nuts. They're a dangerous bunch, though, and are actually still wanted for murder back in 1993 in the state of Wisconsin for three extremely violent sacrificial rituals. Three missing girls ages 11 to 14 were kidnapped from near their homes in Madison. They were found to have been sacrificed in a forest just off Goatman Road. That symbol was on each of the victims' torsos. I started to knack the rest of my whiskey, as advised by Phil. So, what have these guys got to do with Edward Keller? Well, like I said, this whole we summon the goat man and every other forest demon crap was just written off as biblical nonsense. But the things we have seen may suggest otherwise. I didn't need to probe anymore, as Richard jumped in to feel this next section of information. That is where hazard control comes in. You think Wolf Lake is the only national park that we handle? The hazard control department has been deployed across every national park ever since the 1940s. Me and Bob first began working together on the night of the Edward Keller death. They had tracked him to the park, so they obviously needed our guidance and presence in order to find him safely. I was the park representative at the time, and I was sent by the agency. 
At this point, hazard control wasn't a factor in Wolf Lake. There had been deaths, but all perfectly natural and exactly what you might expect in this environment. As soon as I saw the symbol, I forwarded this on to hazard control, and they immediately promoted me to the hazard control rep for Wolf Lake, and instructed me to liaise with Sheriff Farrar. Liaise about what? What happened with Edward Keller? Richard had stalled. A little lost for how to explain the situation, and so I jumped in. Edward Keller was sacrificed by the cult of Kettle Moraine. We believe they had heard about the manhunt for this person. End of the day, when it comes to pledging your loyalty to Satan, there is no bigger pledge than taking the life of a child. They are the most beautiful gift from God that you can receive. And Edward Keller did things to children that should never happen to anyone. He took everything from them. He would take their safety, their innocence, their flesh, and finally, their life. The cult of Kettle Moraine offered Edward Keller a way that he could not only avoid capture, but continue to wreck the lives of the children of Wolf Lake. We think that he grabbed the offer with both hands, or his neck, should we say. So, while his flesh and bones may sit as ash in an urn somewhere, his spirit roams the trees of Wolf Lake. I looked at each man, waiting for them to burst into a fit of laughter and claim that they couldn't do it anymore. There's some sort of hidden show camera presenter bursting into the tower, telling me that I had been punked. But no such luck. The faces of each man were all deadly serious. Phil was already on hand with a third whiskey, a large one. I threw it down neck and let the alcohol take its effect on my nerves. Jesus, so... God, I don't even know what to say. I was lost. It's okay, son. Take your time. I was exactly the same last night. It's a lot to take in, Phil said. The fatherly manner, deliberate. That's right. Phil got a little heated with me last night. I had come to get a statement on the Robertson family. I know none of you are stupid and can see that there is something extremely wrong. But there's a reason that we've covered it up for so long, Richard said. Billy ain't in Virginia, Phil said, tears in his eyes, a lump in his throat. My heart began to race. Jesus, you killed him? You killed him, didn't you? I said looking in Richard and the sheriff's direction. Are you freaking kidding me with this shit? The sheriff exploded towards me, only for Richard and Phil to get in his way. Richard had advised the sheriff to go grab a cigarette on the walkway, and he obliged. They haven't killed anyone, James, but we have lost two rangers now because we didn't know the full situation. You won't know him, but Jim Beckett, who was a veteran ranger here, just before you joined, he got up and left one day, didn't tell us where he was going, just handed his notice in and left. He was acting extremely strange beforehand, Talking about some man in the woods, a man who would cook and eat flesh, he said that he could smell the burning meat on some nights, and then he would have horrible dreams. He started sleepwalking, and we would find him in random places in the park. He was an old man, and we just assumed the stress of the job was taking its toll. So no one really batted an eyelid when he left. We assumed that he had retired. Richard was pouring himself another whiskey. Assumed, I questioned. Richard sat down and took a gulp. He took two items out of his briefcase and slid them across the table. One was a Polaroid photo of what looked like a crime scene photo. It was of a man, aged 65 I would guess. He was flopped forward on a kitchen table. He had a revolver in his right hand. A very serious bullet wound in his temple. He never came to collect his final wage slip, so we went to deliver it to him, and I'll be honest, his behavior before he left gave us cause a lot for concern. We needed to see him, and we found him like that. I was speechless. I didn't know this man, but I couldn't help wonder what on earth got so bad in his head that made him do this. I started to feel sick. When I realized that... I had also smelled burning flesh and had nightmares. 
Was this going to be me? I put the photo down and picked up the second item that Richard had handed over. It was a scrap piece of paper with a list of five bullet points. They were in ballpoint blue ink and were written in almost frantic handwriting. There was dried blood on the paper. I assumed the man wrote this list before he did himself in. I read the note in its entirety out loud. To whom it may concern, I wish to apologize to who may find me, but you must know this was for the greater good. Every word, every whisper, every single ounce of fear we create for him, he grows. If he grows, he will soon walk the earth again. He must not walk this earth. He is in my head. I cannot see what I saw that night in the woods. I did not follow rule number one. I can't unsee that thing and those poor children. I do this to cut his power. With my death, he must find a new victim to spread his message. This will no longer be me. However, if it is you, he seeks out next. Please don't make the mistakes of others. Follow these rules and you may be rid of him. Goodbye. Jim. The five rules to survive the man in the woods. Rule number one. If at any point between the first two hours of nightfall you smell burning, then whatever you do, don't follow the smell. If you do, you will see something so horrible and so diabolical that you will never be able to forget what you've seen. It will haunt you for the rest of your days. Trust me. Rule number two. The more you walk away from the source, the smell will change and begin to get worse. You will start to smell a burning flash. If you smell this, then hold your breath and run away from the smell. Get to higher ground or a large clearing, where you are away from the trees. If you do not do this quick enough, or you do not hold your breath, you will become lightheaded and start to feel extremely drowsy. Every part of you will try to sleep, but whatever you do, fight the urge to sleep. Drink some strong coffee and this should pass in 10 to 15 minutes depending on how well you executed rule number two. If you don't, you will fall asleep and you will sleepwalk deep into the forest. You will wake up in the darkest corner of the woods and you won't be alone. You will feel something watching you. Rule number three. If this happens, don't ever scream for help and you mustn't draw attention to yourself and carefully start to move north, no matter where you wake up. Rule number one still applies, except that if you smell burning or rotten meat, he's too close. As long as you don't make a sound and head north only, then you should be okay. Rule number four. If you encounter him, he will stare at you. He will smile with excitement. Whatever you do, don't make a noise and never break eye contact. If you try to scream for help, you will find your voice to be muted. He will snatch your leg and begin to drag you into the woods. At this point, there is nothing much you can do. Rule number five. If you have a vivid nightmare about children being pursued by a menacing presence, and you wake up between the hours of 3 and 4 a.m., you will find that one of your windows are open, even if you remember locking it. If you notice this, grab whatever belongings you can and leave the cabin. Never look behind you, no matter what you hear. Never turn around. You will wish you were dead. I looked up at everyone. What is this? It sounds like the ramblings of a lunatic. Richard cleared his throat. We had some experts from the University of Columbia examine the ritual surrounding Edward Keller. They described it as a Timur Biles sacrificial ritual which was an ancient pagan tradition for ways of keeping the spirit of a person on earth. The more the love and worship shown, the more power the spirit had. It has a way of immortalizing high commanding people into godlike figures. However, this ritual had been performed, praying to a darker power and given he was hung from the oldest, biggest tree in the park. We believe the shaman was summoning more evil forces through the earth and the roots of the tree. 
So instead of feeding off love and worship, if this ritual was successful, then the entity would thrive off pain, suffering, and fear. The more people knew about it, the more they would fear it and then the entity would increase in power and influence. I was speechless. I was so hell-bent this was a human murderer, but as crazy as this all was, it actually all made sense now. I thought back to every weird thing since I came here. Like how the interviewer reacted when she slipped up with the word them. At this point, she would have just assumed Jim Beckett had left. But Billy was obviously not so straightforward. So where's Billy? If he's not in Virginia and you didn't kill him, I asked. They didn't answer immediately. They both looked out of the tower windows and into the forest. That thing took him, didn't it? I probed. Richard didn't confirm nor deny. I could tell though by Phil's face that Billy was somewhere horrible. Billy obviously meant a lot to Phil, as I'm sure I will one day. And the gutted look on his face as he pictured all the heinous things potentially being done to Billy was all the answer that I needed. An important thing to know, James, we need to keep any knowledge of this thing to a bare minimum. It can never leave this park. Here, we can control it. Limit the damage that it does, Richard said. This was the most absolute statement he had said all evening. I let him continue. Think of it like a virus. Right now, the park is in quarantine. While no one else is talking about it or obsessing about it, its presence will be at a minimum. This is where it will lash out. Danny Waldron had snatched on the anniversary of Edward Keller's death. Do you think that is a coincidence? Or Thomas Kay's father being torn to pieces in his tent while he vanishes into the woods, never to be seen again? All on the anniversary of Marcus Devlin being carved into shreds while he slept and his son Connor being taken. Just another creepy coincidence. What do you think leaving the underwear on the ground is all about, hmm? I'll tell you. It's a message. It's planting seeds in people's minds. Seeds that grow through people's nightmares. It spreads like a virus, and if the true details got out into the town, it won't take long for people to do what you did and connect the dots. Soon everyone starts using Edward Keller's ghost story as an urban legend to scare their children into behaving. And soon, we have a pandemic. He would be able to hurt, kill, and feast on whoever he wanted. Jim Beckett obviously did what he did because he wasn't too obsessed. The entity had its claws in deep with him. He wanted to cut off the creature's power. Luckily for us, he was so involved with the creature that he learned a few ways to beat it. Those rules that you have in front of you. So what happened to Billy then? I asked, necking my sixth glass of whiskey, the edge still refusing to come off. Well, Jim became obsessed after a couple were slaughtered four years ago. Their child has never been found. They made a distress call right before the incident. Richard said, pulling his laptop out of his briefcase and opening it up. He opened a file named Classified and double-clicked a file named 910-16-999 call. It was 17 seconds long. And the audio file was of a woman, voice panicked in an abject terror. Please, someone. We're on a campsite 21 miles north of the visitor center. It's Catherine Tritt. Oh my god, what is that? Please, someone just help us. There's someone outside our... The audio cut off. Just as the start of a blood curdling scream began to explode through the speaker. I noticed that the clip wasn't over though. And you could hear the sound of fabric tearing in something being dragged violently away from the phone. I was confused about what I was meant to be listening to until I remembered the list. Rule number four. If you encounter him, he will stare at you. He will smile with excitement. Whatever you do. Don't make a noise and never break eye contact. If you try to scream for help, you will find your voice to be muted. 
he will snatch your leg and begin to drag you into the woods. So this was it, I asked with a heavy heart, thinking about the evil bestowed upon the family. Yeah, this is what made Jim Beckett begin to connect the dots. He lived in your cabin. Those newspapers are his. He began to collect them and print out historic copies from the internet. He became enthralled with the reincarnation of Edward Keller. We never told him how right he was. That he would have just fueled him and so when he turned a gun on himself. The creature needed another person to spread the fear. Billy, I guessed. Jim told Billy what he had seen and what he thought about the incidents here at Wolf Lake. Richard said. Phil came over, whiskey in hand. Billy started to talk about some dark figure in the woods. He would have nightmares about children and this horrible man approaching them. He said he would smell burning, and one night he went looking for the smell. He said that he found a campsite. There is a tent torn to shreds. There is a log laid by the fire. Sat on the log was a figure. The figure had its back to Bill, but it looked like it was giggling. But that wasn't the worst thing. It looked like it was eating something. Or should I say, someone. Phil took a break, swallowed some more whiskey, and tried to find the words for what came next. He told me and Alan that the figure, when it became aware of his presence, it stood up. When it turned, he could see the figure was mainly a black mass. But its eyes and teeth were white as white can be. Almost cartoonish in their appearance. It had an infant's arm in its hand, with the bone snapped off at the elbow joint. Flesh torn, blood splattered, skin caught between the figure's teeth. He said the figure began to giggle uncontrollably. Billy turned and ran. He turned up at my cabin and started spouting it all to me, but I just thought he had a bit of cabin fever. Stupid old man. Phil slapped himself in the head as the frustration and the whiskey began to hit him. Richard jumped in. Two weeks ago, we found Billy's window wide open, and there were scratch marks made from his bed to the window, which continued into the clearing outside his cabin and then, and then they went into the woods. The scratches showed signs of blood with broken fingernail fragments and wood splinters. They were made by someone clinging on for dear life. The marks became more and more frantic as they approached the woods. So why are you telling me? I asked. Because the last two people who this thing was infecting, we kept in the dark. Now they're both dead. Last night, I came here to talk to Phil about the Robertson. He mentioned that you and him had a little chat and you mentioned Danny Waldron and the strange nightmares. I've kept the rangers in the dark about this long enough. So I decided enough was enough and I needed to take a different approach. So I told Phil everything. Edward Keller, the cult, Jim Beckett, everything. I also told him what really happened with Billy. Things understandably got extremely heated when he heard what had come of his protege. I told him to invite you here tonight. Because you needed to know what was going on. Because James, it's coming for you. You need to be ready. I felt sick. The feeling of violation washing over me. What do you mean it's coming for me? First Jim, then Billy, now you. Phil mentioned you had an episode right before we showed up. Richard leant forward, like a counselor trying to help a patient. Yeah, I just felt really lightheaded and wanted to sleep, but Phil got me inside. I said while Richard nodded along. And can you remember what had triggered it? He probed. Um, I was walking to the tower when I smelled something. It was, it was... I struggled to remember what the smell was, but when I remembered, my face and my heart both dropped. It was what? Richard pushed. Burning flesh. I gulped and confessed. Richard and Phil shared a concerned look. Do you see? It starts by making you know about it. You'll notice it everywhere. TV, radio, newspapers. 
And then once you know about it, you will think about it. That's when it gets in your dreams. That's when you tell your coworkers, your friends, your family. You plant more seeds than other people. And then it turns out the pressure makes you smell it, see it in the woods. Then, when it's taken over everything, it will come for you, Richard said. I just sat there, trying to find holes in the story, praying it was a joke, but everything now made sense. It feasts on fear. The experts at the uni say that pagan legend states these types of entities will induce fear, much like a chef stuffing a pig to eat. Then, it will devour them. Right now, you're doing everything that it wants. You're running around the park talking about Edward Keller and the horrible stuff that he did. Now, it's trying to lure you into seeing it. Which is why you need that list, son. I picked up the note, studying the list of rules written by Jim Beckett. Was I going to need these? Now I knew what was happening. I wouldn't be paying it any attention. Right, I think this is enough for one night. Besides, there's no more whiskey. Come on, James, we'll take you back to your cabin, Richard said. Oh, and one more thing. According to the anthropologist, the pagan ritual used on Edward Keller has a blind spot. The sacrifice was done when he died from the hanging. But the ritual wasn't completed until the rope was cut and his body hit the earth. So those on scene clocked Keller's time of death at 7.55 to 8 p.m., and we cut his body down at 10.25 p.m. So between these two times, he has no influence or power. You can roam the woods, speak and dream freely. You'll be perfectly safe. I took out a pen and wrote rule number six. Never speak about Edward Keller or anything regarding him. Between the hours of 10.25 p.m. and 8 p.m., while Richard continued... James, you're not a robot. It's 10-12 p.m. right now. There's no way you're going to be able to put this out of your mind in the next 13 minutes. So, keep that list closed and if you find yourself in trouble, follow it to the letter. Here. Richard threw a piece of metal at me, which after I caught it and inspected it, I saw it was a compass. North, Richard said with a wink. North. I repeated back to him with a nod. Sheriff Ferrar came back into the tower and barked at Richard. Come on, Richard, it's nearly 1025. Richard nodded to the sheriff. Come in, Bob. You go get the car started. Me and James will be right down. The sheriff rolled his eyes. He clearly wasn't fond of me. I didn't blame him in all honesty. I accused him of all these horrible things. He stormed off down the stairs. Well, gentlemen, I think eventually when we are facing evil and losing, we need to try a different plan of attack. I've tried keeping it quiet, but this thing finds a way of getting around. So I'm trying a different approach, by letting you know what you're up against, Richard said. As we finished our glasses of whiskey in unison, a symbol of our newfound teamwork against this dark forest. But James, uh, Phil... Please don't make me regret this. I will not hesitate to think of the bigger picture if I feel either of you are becoming a liability, Richard said, back to his harsh, dark tone. Not an ounce of budge in his seriousness. I didn't know what to say. I just turned and shook the hand of Phil, and then grabbed my belongings from the couch while Phil and Richard shook hands. When we exited the cabin, I walked out to the tower balcony Richard was nowhere to be seen. I was confused. He was literally right in front of me. I turned back to see Phil's tower plunged into darkness. The tower looked like it had never been lived in before. I started to feel lightheaded again. I stumbled down the tower steps. When I got to the bottom, there was still no Richard. A 100-yard walk down the trail, however, I could see the sheriff's car. It was parked up, engine running, and the driver's side door was wide open. I approached closer, noticing a large amount of blood on the door's interior, dripping onto the dirt trail. A red-stained drag mark disturbed the earth, which led into the woods. My heart began to beat faster and harder. I began to follow the blood trail and drag marks into the woods. 
I was stepping over logs and branches, ducking under branches until I came to a clearing. Sheriff Farrar sat in the middle of the clearing, in the clutches of a dark figure. The figure had its two razor-sharp fingers plunged into Bob Farrar's eye sockets, right down to the knuckles, the other three fingers clamping around his neck. Its other hand was tearing into his torso, pulling out his insides and holding them up to its face, where its giggling, excited smile began to gorge on the fleshy organs. The sheriff reached a hand out for me, begging me to help him, pleading in pure turmoil. I stood in horror, watching the violence unfold when somebody pulled on my trouser leg. I turned to my left and saw nothing. But then I heard a voice. It was a child's voice. It said, hey, Excuse me, Mr. Ken. Can you help me find my mom and dad? I don't know where they are. I looked down to see the child, and that's when I saw what was asking me for help. It was a young boy who stood there, but his skin had been removed. His body burned. His left arm, both his eyes and his left side of his torso were all missing, having been clearly removed. The horror made me snap upright. I was sweating and hyperventilating. I had laid on my bed, reminiscing about the meeting with Phil and Richard, and all the horrific tales that they had told me. I hadn't even realized that I had drifted off. And then all of a sudden I panicked. I remembered one of the rules. Rule number five. If you have a vivid nightmare about children being pursued or even hurt by a menacing presence, and you wake up between the hours of 3 and 4 a.m., you will find that one of your windows are open, even if you remember locking it. If you notice this, grab whatever belongings you can and leave the cabin. Never look behind you, no matter what you hear. Never turn around. You will wish you were dead. I jumped up and checked the time. 2.59 a.m., just outside the time frame the rule spoke about. I checked the window anyway. I looked out the window and into the dark, menacing forest, wondering if it was watching me. I couldn't see anything, so I decided to double-check the window and go back to bed. Thankfully, the window was locked. This time, 